Outlaw King is a movie that's impossible to review without talking about Braveheart, and both movies are impossible to talk about without also talking about Kilts, that most glorious Scottish man skirt. Before we get there though, let's rewind a second. Braveheart and Outlaw King both center on the wars of independence that racked Scotland around the turn of 1300 AD. Braveheart is the story of William Wallace, who in the film's universe was a simple man who wanted a simple life but who the cruel English forced into a righteous war of independence after they murdered his wife. After being betrayed by the Scottish nobility, he is eventually drawn and quartered in public, but not before giving one final cry of Freedom! It's a great movie, but very much a product of the 90s. Dramatic and sincere, bordering on mawkish, with epic vistas of the Scottish highlands and a sweeping orchestral score. Good guys who are heroic, humble, everyday men, and bad guys who are mincing and scheming and evil. So our little rule succeeded. And while this upstart awaits my arrival in York, my forces will have arrived in Edinburgh behind him. Outlaw King picks up almost exactly where Braveheart ends, with the Scottish nobility bitterly bending the knee and swearing loyalty to the English king. I'm proud of you, Robert. You had the courage to stand up to me, and the wisdom to stand down. It's the story of Robert the Bruce, a Scottish nobleman and claimant to the throne who was actually featured pretty prominently as a character in Braveheart and follows his guerrilla campaign against the English that ultimately wins Scotland its independence. It's a sharp contrast in tone to Braveheart, subdued and realistic in place of dramatic and sentimental, specific instead of broad. That isn't to say it isn't a powerful movie though, just a less showy one than Braveheart, with a palpable tension beneath its naturalistic dialogue and performances. Robert the Bruce is a more complicated figure than Wallace, and beneath the subdued mask Chris Pine gives him, there's a sense of deep emotion and intelligence, and a constant awareness of the political ramifications of his every act. We swore vows on King Edmund's Bible that we will need to break. What would Father say? Father is gone. This is my decision, but you are my blood, my family. I cannot do this without you. Visually, the movie is stunning, with great cinematography throughout. The opening long take of the movie with the Scottish nobility bending the knee is a truly masterful scene, not just for its technical complexity, but for the way the whirling camera and pulsing score establish the underlying tension between the Scottish and English. What would you say to a duel right now? Back old times. I break my oath already. <laughs> the order is to come and arm your Quiet. And while on a smaller scale than, for example, the battles in The Lord of the Rings, the culminating battle of Outlaw King is wonderfully shot, balancing the confusion and brutality of battle without becoming lost to shaky cam. <laughs> The genuineness of the chemistry between Robert the Bruce and his new wife is also something you don't see in a lot of movies. A lot of movies tend to just tack on a romance to their plot, but in Outlaw King, both characters feel whole, independent, and like people in their own right. Elizabeth, I have to speak to my brothers. That's fine, I can hear what you have to say. The interplay between them is both intelligent and charming, without relying on sentimentality or emotional shortcuts to get them smushing faces by the end of the movie. What you did today was uh, brave. Anything else? No. Good night then. Good There's nothing more emblematic of the differences between Braveheart and Outlaw King than their use of the kilt. As a symbol of Scottish masculinity and national pride, it seems like a perfect fit for movies about Scottish independence. But the problem is that the kilt as we know it wasn't adopted until the 1600s, and both Braveheart and Outlaw King are firmly set around the turn of 1300. Braveheart doesn't care about the anachronism of Scotland wearing a skirt hundreds of years before it was adopted, and proudly outfits its freedom fighters in plaid man skirts. By contrast, there is nary a kilt to be seen on screen at any point in Outlaw King, which is largely accurate to the period with its costumes. And that's the key difference between the two movies. Braveheart wants to be an entertaining movie that represents the spirit of Scottish independence. Outlaw King is concerned with the intricacies and specifics of the historical situation. 
Neither approach is right or wrong, both valid ways of engaging with history, but I can't help but feel like it puts Outlaw King in something of an awkward and unfavorable position. Because Braveheart is such a loud and genuinely emotional and engaging movie, Outlaw King can't help but feel less impactful in its shadow. It's interesting to watch, but doesn't stick with you the same way Braveheart does after the credits roll. It's a bit like listening to a lullaby after a rock concert, the subdued, emotional notes of the characters in Outlaw King hard to hear after the crash of Braveheart's sound and fury. That they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! <laughs> It's in the two main characters that you can see the effect most clearly. Bruce never quite pops on screen as much as Wallace did. He's not as likable a character, and worse, not as engaging. Because Wallace is such a broad and expressive character, it's easier to empathize with the emotional ups and downs as he wins and loses against the English. I want to live. I want a home and children and peace. Do you? I do. I've asked God for those things. It's all for nothing if you don't have freedom. That's just a dream, William. A dream? Just a <laughs> what have we been doing all this time? Wallace, by contrast, is always guarded, and even when he learns his brothers are dead and his wife and child captured, the emotion still never quite cracks the surface. As a standalone film, this might have worked okay, but after Wallace, Bruce can't help but feel a little... dull. You wanted to be king. Well, you're king now. This is the price you pay. We only win if you survive. Another misstep of Outlaw Kings is that it's trying so hard to deal with the complexity of the historical situation that it forgets to set up certain basic emotional beats. As trite as the English murdering Wallace's wife is, it serves an important story function. It shows why the English are bad, why the Scottish want freedom, and it makes the war personal for Wallace. Personal in a way that it never quite is for Bruce, because Outlaw King forgets to show the English doing anything particularly bad in the first half of the movie besides hiking up taxes. Of course, to make this case for Scottish independence, Braveheart has to invent out of whole cloth the idea of the English imposing prima nocta rights, which was never a real thing in medieval times. As lord of these lands, I will bless this marriage by taking the bride into my bed on the first night of her union. But here again we can see the difference between Braveheart and Outlaw King. Braveheart makes something up to illustrate English oppression, while the more accurate Outlaw King doesn't, which makes it feel lackluster by comparison. Outlaw King starts with all of the Scottish characters talking about how tired they are of war. And if I were to infer that your aim was in fact to reignite a rebellion, we already tried it for eight bloody years. And we failed. The movie, and Bruce by extension, forgets to ever really make the case for why restarting war with the English is worth it. It's hard to feel like the Scots shouldn't have just paid their taxes. Once the war starts, the English do plenty of terrible things, but it's again hard not to feel like Bruce isn't the one who started it. This has nothing to do with the actual historical situation, by the way. It's purely about what's shown on screen within the self-contained world of the movie. The thing is that the Scottish Wars of Independence simply aren't something that most of us have a strong understanding of outside of Braveheart, and thus we need Outlaw King to make its case independently. And when it doesn't, we as the audience are forced to tie it back to Braveheart, which inevitably invites comparison. Fairly or unfairly, the reality is that Outlaw King is a movie that will always be in conversation with Braveheart. Braveheart was simply too popular a movie and too close in historical time period for the two to ever be fully teased apart. Outlaw King is a good movie, but it will always be in its shadow, an awkward sequel addendum to that film's events and cultural impact.